We are the, the Pod, Pod Doctors. Doctors. Welcome to the Pod Doctors. I'm Dr. Damien Dauphiné, and I'm here with my partner, Dr. Rafi Hussein. And uh, today we are going to go probably to one of the most common things that we see in the office with regard to uh, annoying skin lesions. Yeah. So uh, annoying skin lesions could be uh, just a regular callus. They could be something called a porokeratoma, which is kind of an amorphous diagnosis that uh, you find very little information uh, about it on the, um, on the web to, to Veruca, which are actual viral infections of the skin causing uh, Veruca plantaris or planter's wart. So all of these things are interesting. They're in the category of an annoyance. They don't kill people. There's no three day walk for porokeratomas. Uh, so there's not, to my knowledge, any research going into why these things show up and what they are and how to treat them because they don't kill people and there's no money in treating them. But this podcast is not simply focused on the sexy, important things that we do on a daily basis, but also on the everyday stuff that drives people crazy. So Yeah, it's the everyday stuff that kind of um, we see through the door. It's not, a, it's, it's not it, limited to all the fancy, shiny. Right. You know, it's, it's worth spending, you know, 30 or 40 minutes just kind of educating people on, okay, what is this thing on my foot? Um, and then also to understand that some of these lesions are being caused by a bony problem underneath the skin that's really the issue. So I, I saw a patient who had that uh, exact scenario this morning. Um, he has hallux rigidus, which we need to do a show on hallux rigidus sometime soon. But he has a problem with the range of motion of his gray toe, and he has a, a subluxed or partially dislocated second toe, and the two toes are rubbing against each other, and his main issue that he thinks is the real problem is just this skin lesion or this callus between his toes that causes pain. And what I had to explain to him was, yes, this skin lesion is a problem, but the underlying bony deformity is really where the issue is. So um, I think we've got uh, some good information about what these little buggers are and how we can treat them, how we can palliate, in some cases, and then actually treat the underlying cause in, in other cases. So we are going to, again, delve into the differences between certain skin lesions, which uh, are, are benign and annoying, uh, but don't get a lot of respect. They cause all kinds of problems, but they don't kill people. Uh, there's not a lot of research being done on them, I think, for that reason. There's no three-day walk for poor keratomas. Yeah. So, um, but they are a constant annoyance. And for some people, the sole reason they come into the office. So, corn versus callus versus wart. Yeah, common things. People like to use the words interchangeably, but they're kind of their own special thing. Corns and calluses, a little bit more closer together. Warts are actually a viral infection of the mm -hmm. skin. And um, uh, as far as corns and calluses go, the way we kind of, I don't know, split them up. Calluses tend to be more superficial, more diffuse, and corns tend to be uh, pinpoint, deeper, have a core to them. Um, Nucleated. Yeah. Be the term. Yeah. And then also, you know, you can see that the, the pictures on the left, you know, those are invariably involving a bone spur underneath um, and a toe that's rotated over. So... That's where, you know, patients will come in with a skin lesion and we'll say, well, we need to get x-rays. And the patient's like, well, why do you need x-rays? Yeah. Because uh, we have to show you the bone lesion underneath that's the source of your problem. Uh, here's a little overview. Callus is, you know, superficial. And then as we go to corns, you got that deep core to it. Um, that's why corns tend to be a little bit more painful than calluses, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so corns, sometimes they'll be hard, sometimes they'll be soft, depending on the location, and we'll, we'll dive into these. Um, but most common question I guess I get is, uh, what's that core? What's that uh, center spot? Am I supposed to take that out? So that goes back to what Dr. D was talking about, uh, the bony prominence. 
Um, sometimes what happens, depending on the location, you'll have a bony prominence where the um, callus or corn or whatever it might be ends up building up. There's a biomechanical problem for why what this all this happens. Um, I don't know how else to explain it. I mean, it's we could a, talk about specific examples like hammer toes. Well, it, it's just simply a pressure point. You know, when yeah. you when you look at that far left, upper left picture, the one beneath the second metatarsal head, that one there, clearly that second metatarsal head is receiving more pressure and friction yeah, than the others. Picture. Hold on. <clears throat> there you go. And then those on the tops of the toes, yeah, th th they're a direct result of shoe gear riding that joint. So... You know, when it's on the top of the toe, it's really both a combination of shoe gear, irritant, and then deformity. And, it, you know, you can fix the deformity, but if the patient doesn't change their shoe gear habits, you know, they could end up with the same problem in yeah, the same the fancy place. fancy tight shoes, the high yep. heels, the flats. Right. So it's got to be a combination on the top. On the bottom of the foot, it, you know, it may just simply be a biomechanical problem a structural problem that needs to be addressed. And in that picture in the lower uh, half of that picture where you've got the circles around the, the, the uh, callus, you know, that patient's got a hammer toe and it's the hammer toe that's driving that metatarsal head down through the bottom of the foot. That retrograde yeah. pressure pushing yep. down. On there that you go. That's a perfect example of what, what's happening. So mechanically, if you fix the hammer toe, then you get the toe out, from on top of the metatarsal, you relieve that pressure point and you can see the callus go away on its own most of the time where you don't even have to do anything specific to the callus. Yeah, so that's a, a great reason to why we get the x-rays. Yes, because it's really a bony problem. Uh, you're seeing the skin react to the bony problem underneath. Uh, another common question is um, when patients ask, um, does the callus protect my skin? Should I be removing it or should I not be removing it? Yeah, I, I mean, I've never, I, I think calluses are clearly not protective. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's where you're, you're going to tear them if they get thick enough, they can cause wounds in diabetic patients who don't, or don't have enough sensation. So th this type of a callus in a diabetic patient is a huge red flag and a real danger zone. In a non-diabetic patient or someone who doesn't have neuropathy, it would simply be painful. Yeah. And, and there's ways we can address uh, that pain. Um, the repairing of these calluses or removing that callus tissue is not covered by insurance in the vast majority of cases. So when patients come in for these, we have to explain to them, hey, look, this isn't covered. If you want me to do this, I can do this for you, but it's not covered by insurance. And not, there's a lot of things expensive. people can use, um, you know, creams, uh, corn pads, the exfoliating, um, we're, dremel like things. We're big fans of the urea cream, you yeah. know, 40% urea. That particular one, Revitoderm, is one we have, have in the office. It works great. It And it can really get the skin to go from those cracked heels to the normal appearance on the right within a few weeks. Yeah. So but you have to consistently use it. A lot of people yeah. think I can just use it and then be done with it. No. Uh, there's a reason you're getting those corns, calluses that, uh, the hypertrophy of that skin, using that urea cream, using any type of uh, exfoliating agent is going to help keep that skin nice and soft, prevent that callus from building up, but it's going to still, you know, want to build up. Mm -hmm. If you stop using it, expect to see that slowly come back. And the other advantage of the urea creams is it's pulling moisture from the deep layers of your skin. It's pulling moisture from the air. Yeah. So the, the, heel cracks in that one patient that that's very common in people who like to wear sandals all the time yeah. and they're just letting moisture evaporate out into the, out into the air. Um, so that's, that's an, again, it's a habit issue. If you wear sandals in the middle of winter, when we have, um, you know, a humidity level that's in the thirties, you're, you're going to lose uh, fluids out of your skin. You're going to be just evaporating tissue fluid. So that's a habit issue that you need to address too. What about those uh, corn pads with the salicylic acid? Are you a fan of those? They make me a little nervous. I think you know there's very little um, there's very little evidence that they work better than uh, the urea cream with a little yeah. elbow grease. And and if the salicylic acid causes enough tissue damage, you could it can lead to a secondary. Um, infection, which 
we've seen. Uh, so we don't recommend them in diabetic patients with neuropathy because they oh, just yeah, can't feel not. them enough. Or anyone who has peripheral arterial disease. Yeah, another one. Um, the average Joe who has normal sensation and normal blood flow, <clears throat> it might help soften it um, a little bit more so than your, the urea creams, but I think the urea creams work so well. Yeah, I say if you're going to use it, use it for about a week or so. And then go back to the, your basics, ureas, the ammonium lactase, lac hydrins. And, and people, I think, have the misunderstanding that you get rid of it once, then it's gone. And you, you brought it up, the fact that, no, there's a mechanical problem here. It's going to keep coming back. And you don't want something like that on your skin in perpetuity. Uh, you want to make sure you're doing it for a short period of time. So this is where I think we can be very helpful in addressing these areas. That one on the fifth toe that you have there, this is... Uh, the, the title of the slide says treatment options, bony surgery. Um, this is a great explanation of that particular, uh, we call them haloma mollies, so yeah. yeah, soft corn in that on that fifth toe. That is specifically because of bone, rubbing against bone between your fourth and fifth toes. Yeah. And that yep. pressure point that ends up forming between there ends up being a hot spot. Yep. Super tender. I mean, the old school treatment for this, and I tell patients all the time, is uh, lamb's wool. They used to take lamb's wool mm -hmm. and stuff in between there. You can use a cotton ball. You can use whatever. But if you have to space those toes out. Now, it's difficult if you're wearing shoes all the time right. because the shoes are squeezing those toes together. And it's such an easy fix surgically. Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah, it's, an is easy. it's an arthroplasty, which is taking out a little bit of bone. I like to do, uh, as you show in these pictures here, I take out the, yeah. the proximal phalanx, but I also shave down the base of the fourth. Yeah. They buzzed it down. It looks like they it did. It really doesn't show much of a difference in the x-rays, but um, in the description, I'm almost certain that they say they buzz that yeah. down. And most docs do, because you're not trying to just fix one side. There's two sides of the problem. So uh, You just want to hedge your bets, yeah. you know? and that, that makes a lot of sense. But that it's such a quick recovery, too. You're just asking the skin to heal. You're yeah. not asking the bone to heal. So it's two weeks in a post-op shoe. Uh, take stitches out of two weeks. Get on with your life. So you could fix this problem pretty readily with a pretty simple surgery. Orthotics. Are you a big fan of orthotics for these? Uh, for the, for the plantar or the, the bottom of the foot calluses. Yeah, of course. I think they work well. I think plastizote, the, the peach colored material is a great option because you have the opportunity to let that bony prominence seat into that material and mold around it's like a prominence. dense memory foam if, yep. if you never felt it. It won't it, spring back. It just crushes down. Mm -hmm. So it actually contours to your foot over time. The more you wear them, the the more it adjusts specifically to your foot. And what we do is when you come in, we'll see them sometimes. We'll pull your liners out. We'll look at these uh, orthotics. And we'll see that they're indented in a certain area. And depending on how they're indented, we might cushion, adjust. We might put some felt on there to offload. You can see here that they've adjusted uh, to offload the second metatarsal here and uh, probably the uh, second there a second yeah, yeah. And it's just a Different. simple effective we're specifically adjusting your orthotics to more uh, customize them to your foot deformity right simple effective and we use the same material <clears throat> the plastizote the peach colored material we use that in our diabetic patients as a way to offload any bony prominences that they might have because those bony prominences lead to calluses, which can become ulcers very quickly. So we're very familiar with that material. We use it all the time. And it does work great in our non-diabetic population when yeah. they just have that painful callus we're trying to control. For your classic accommodative orthotics. Right. Not for your functional. Right. Uh, excising them. What do you think about this? If you're going to... If you're going to do the skin excision along with some bone work... Yes. I think that's helpful. If you're just going to excise the lesion, and exp it's like uh, Einstein's uh, definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over and expect a different result, right? So you would continually have to excise the same area because they're going to get it back. So, a, yeah, if you do it with bone work, I think it makes perfect sense. And it's a common thing patients ask for. You know, yeah. it, as we talk about it, it kind of makes sense. You know, there's a bony prominence. That's why you get that corner callus, that uh, intractable plantar keratosis and it becomes tender you're like oh can i just can you six it looks blah, blah, blah. let's just cut it out can you just ellipse it yeah can yeah. you just cut it out um, but there's a reason that's forming there yeah. so that's when we talk about the bony procedures to offload to fix the hammer toe if it's a hammer toe uh, to 
if it's a metatarsal that's elongated, a second metatarsal, very common. If it's elongated, it will shorten. It's called a wild procedure. Um, quick fix to a, um, a problem that's <laughs> ultra tender. Yep. What else? Cushion, gel, foam liners. What do you think? I love these, uh, the Silopose sleeves. Those little toe sleeves are great. Um, so if you have patients that have a minor hammer toe procedure or a minor hammer toe deformity, yeah. they have the callus. They're really not good surgical candidates. I mean, uh, every day, all day, we use these. They work great. Um, <clears throat> I think the silicone pad that that fits around the big toe and goes over the bunion bump those things are great too yeah because it's uh, a pressure spot absolutely and if that's all their complaint uh involves and they have a mild to moderate bunion deformity maybe they're not a good surgical candidate but i think the the ones that you can chop up for individual toes are awesome so you know we sew oh, yeah. the, the sleeve and they'll just cut it up and it's like a little toe sock it's 360 degrees of silicone gel protects the the lesion they Works come great. in felt. They come in different materials. My personal favorite is silicone. I think you yeah, feel the same. Absolutely. You can use those over and over again, and it's uh, simple. It's effective. I mean, you're not complicating the, the simple here. I don't think those the little foam eyelets are very helpful. Yeah, I think there's better things on the market than those. Yeah, I, I prefer large felt. Well, or I, f- I prefer the gel strap that you oh, that yeah. fits over the big toe and then covers. All met all the med heads with a quarter of an inch of silicone gel. That I think that thing works great. Love that thing. I should have put a picture of that in there. Um, but yeah, uh, let's go back to this. Yes. What is that core? So that core, when it comes to corns and calluses, that's the deepest point, and that's usually the most tender point. But what really is it? It's usually a point of neurovascular injury um so my best example is like a smoker you know a smoker comes in has those painful calluses why is that happening uh, that trauma from that callus and that skin uh, becomes an ischemic point a point where the blood flow is limited where that uh, central core ends up becoming the most tender because uh, you're walking on it it's like an upside down pyramid that you're constantly injuring over and over again and then we're pairing these out it's ultra tender we're not doing something to harm it we're actually trying to help you but i mean they're they're tough uh that in that you're right it's the tissue is changing because of all the pressure the micro ischemia from all the pressure the shape of the core of these things and so that's where you've seen all kinds of different uh, treatment options tried over the years. Some of them have been injectable silicone. Yeah. Um, there was a, an old school podiatrist that was sort of infamous for trying just about everything you could think of. Fat pad transfers. They, they're doing those. Uh, I mean, I've done a couple of those. Yeah. I, I like them. I, I think they're, um, they're underutilized, but I do think that there's a lifespan to them. Yes. So the literature shows that when you do those fat pad injections, they'll shrink down to about 50% a couple months out, depending on how much wear and tear it is in the location, which is to be expected when you tell patients that up front. Um, but their lifespan, I would say, is about two to three years as far as that fat pad goes. And it's a good way of uh, offloading a site that, uh, for example, a diabetic patient has a callus that forms there over and over again, not a candidate for surgery or doesn't want to do surgery. This will push off that uh, procedure Hopefully, two to three years, if not longer, if you offload it properly. But they have um, have a lifespan. Yeah, Yeah. it has a lifespan, and I think it needs to be addressed. So the other thing we used to do is is try a graft jacket, and there was yeah, I've done that too, where you you pull it it under. Yeah, you kind of pull it underneath the lesion. Um, I did that several times; seemed to work in some patients, didn't work in others. But ultimately, if if you can address the bony issue. I mean, yeah. if, if they have the hammer toes and you can address the hammer toe problem and they or the horrible claw toes, the really serious claw toes, um, you know, you're going to reduce the retrograde force and get rid of the lesion by itself. And that just whatever you do, even if you only get partial um, a partial success with the surgery, you, you, it's just an area you can offload easier now. Yeah, here's an example of the claw toes that Dr. D was talking yeah. about. 
We get that painful callus on that tip. Well, they'll get one on the tip, and then they'll also get one on on yeah, they usually the, get one meta, right down here. the meta head. Yeah, and that that combo is difficult. But yeah, it's clearly clearly something that can be corrected by correcting the claw toe deformity. In that case, you'd have to fix the bunion too, because you can see what yeah. the big toe is doing. It's shoving all the toes over. Uh, but those folks do really well, and we would do these almost every week. We're we're fixing that type of foot structure to eliminate those pressure points. Because in a diabetic patient with neuropathy, that, that callus seems benign, but that, that is a precursor to an ulcer yeah. and, and would be a significant source of potential morbidity for the patient if you don't do something. So we tried diabetic shoes with the inserts first, but if that's not working and they keep getting the lesion back over and over and they have adequate blood flow and their blood sugars are relatively well controlled, that's a patient where we'd wanna fix the hammer toe. Yeah. You know, yeah. when people think we can just cushion and offload these type of problems, but patients are always in their shoes. They're not always in their um, orthotics. So they're like, yeah, are you? I'm wearing my orthotics, but I only wear them when I'm out. So I'm like, all right, you got to wear these at home. You yeah. got to gotta take that pressure off I, those toes. We hear that all the time. I, I, I wear, But doc, I wear them when I go out. Well, the other 10,000 steps that you took in yeah. your house yesterday is why you still have the lesion coming back as quickly as it does. So, yeah, I think there's this disconnect between the shoes I wear outside the house and sh and the slippers I wear inside the house. And if you have lesions like this or foot pain, you have to fix that paradigm. You got to shift that paradigm or you're going to continue to be disappointed with your, your situation. You've so, got to always wear your orthotics if they're being used to offload certain areas, right. no matter what you're doing. If you're walking on carpet at home, that's not enough pressure relief yeah. to eliminate this from being an issue. So, yep, all good points. Well, I mean, as far as corns and calluses go, that that's as deep as we can dive. If y'all have any questions, please message. Um, you know, write us questions on the uh, the comment section. Um, please like, follow, subscribe. This is a so we could talk br or briefly before we we maybe just mention why these are different than warts, and so oh, yeah. there are some yeah there are some specific indicators for Veruca plantaris or plantar wart, and th that one you have there shows some of it, and that you're seeing the skin lines bend around that lesion, and we're also looking for pinpoint black dots. And then when you debride it or you trim the callus off, do you get pinpoint bleeding? And in those cases, you've got capillaries that are feeding that little viral infection. And so those capillaries virus, are very, very easy to, to yeah, cut. So the virus infects that basal layer, that basement mm -hmm. layer of that skin. And as that wart grows out, because it's a separate lesion, as that wart grows out, it pushes those skins out, that skin, uh, skin lines out. And that's why you see that break in that skin line. Mm -hmm. That pinpoint bleeding is from all the blood that your body's pushing to that wart because that wart virus has tricked your body to uh, feed it. All, yeah. Yeah. To, it's, yeah. It's like a tumor in that regard. Yeah. Tumors do the same thing. You know, they attract blood vessels. They 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 feed they wall themselves off and they they feed on your own blood flow. So, so that so, pinpoint bleeding is all that blood flow that you'll see in there. Right. And and, and I think this is helpful when we're treating these topically. We typically. I mean, my favorite uh, is a combination of 5-fluorouracil yeah. and salicylic acid. And that combination is interesting because the salicylic acid causes blistering and peeling. So you're, sh you're shedding virus that way, theoretically. And then the 5-fluorouracil, uh, the idea behind that particular additive is that it's going to go after cells that are acting strangely, that, are, that are, have uh, issues. Um, they're... It's going after damaged DNA, essentially. Yeah. And so that combination gives you this vigorous immune response, too. And that's what you're hoping for. Because this is a pretty wimpy virus. If your immune system targets it, it can get rid of it relatively quickly. If but you it, give it enough time, it'll, yeah. it'll usually heal up on its own. Or, or, or it'll spread. Months and, months <laughs> or it'll spread. and that's the downside. So yeah. I, think, I think addressing these when we can is helpful. We used to you know, really curette them out and do all this real trauma to the skin. But when it's a weight-bearing part of the foot... 
I prefer to use these topicals, have yeah. the patient come back every two weeks. Just take that superficial callus off. Take all that stuff down. And then we actually apply the same stuff right here in the office. We apply uh, the same compound right here in the office, so. right on that, that raw so wound bed. And then have them use duct tape over it every you know 12 hours or so, every, twice a day. And, it, and that combination every two weeks, usually we can get rid of a wart that size in about four to six weeks and not leave yeah. scar tissue. Yeah. That's huge. So, because leaving scar tissue in that area, the patient's going to feel it for the rest of their life. So we try to avoid that. And I think we're pretty successful with that. Um, we get people on that program, get them back every two weeks. And then once, once it's healed, once we can see the skin lines returning through that area, then we have them just monitor. And if they see any of these little pinpoint areas that may pop up, have them start attacking it and then come in and see us. And, and that really seems to work because currently there's no vaccine or the HPV virus that causes this particular problem, the strain of the of the human papillomavirus, they have a vaccine for the one that causes cervical warts, but it's different enough from this bugger that there's no vaccine that will attack this one because that would be great. Again, this is a problem that is global, causes all kinds of annoyance, but doesn't kill anybody. Yeah. And, and it's uh, not fancy, shiny. It's not it's exactly. Not so no one's no one's going to put any zero. money into a vaccine, especially during COVID. But um, you know, we got other vaccines we need to create. But it is interesting in that that this is a, a global problem. People have issues with this um, all over the world, and the treatments are varied because not one thing seems to work for all warts. However, having said that, I think we've had a really good run of the last almost 15 years for me of using that five floor year or so on sal acid seems to work well. Yeah. Awesome. Very good. Well, Dr. Hussein, thank you very much for this uh, primer on annoying skin lesions and what you can do about them. Uh, when in doubt, call your podiatrist. That's great. Thank you very much for joining us this week on the pod doctors. We'll see you guys next time. Take care. We are the, the pod, pod doctors. doctors.